Welcome to Red Eyes Creations Radio. Thank you for tuning in. This is Henrik Palmgren and we're coming to you from the west coast of Sweden. The website is redeyescreations.com where you can find all our radio programs archived. We also have a subscriber section with the extended interviews with many of our guests for those of you who really want to dive deeper into the subjects that we cover on this program. We also have a frequently updated news section with the stories, links to important news and videos and research. And I'm glad that you are here and tune in today. We have a very important subject for today's program. We have the great pleasure of being joined by Eric John Phelps. Uh, Mr. Phelps is the author to Vatican Assassins. Uh, I think many tuning into this program are aware to some extent of Eric and his work. And uh, this is a big subject and there is, of course, much to discuss. Uh, what I'd like to do is start as much as possible from the beginning and go through some of the history of the Jesuits, talk about the important people and historical figures with connections to the Vatican and the Jesuits. Uh, and I think that this will lead us into some very interesting avenues. Eric's website is uh, vaticanassassins.org. You need to head over there and take a long look around. There's much information up there for you to discover and explore. And I also want to mention uh, Eric's book, Vatican Assassins. It's an almost a 700-page uh, magnum opus, basically, and this is one of those books that is a must-have as a reference for everyone who is seriously want to uh, you know, study history and understand, uh, I guess, the hidden history also. And I've been looking forward to this program for a long time, so let's get our guest on the line and get into it. Uh, hi, Eric. Welcome to Red Eyes Creations Radio. Hi, Henrik. A pleasure to be with you and your listeners. I might add a correction here. The, my third edition of Vatican Assassins is 1,836 pages in four volumes. It's an e-book only, but it can be downloaded and be put in book form by the purchaser, and it can be translated into any language uh, without a permission from me or the producer so that it can be uh, disseminated quicker. Okay, wow, great. Uh, and even more material in there is closing up to 1,000 pages sooner. <laughs> yes, 1,836 pages, plus I have also the uh, free CD with it that I had originally with my book, mm -hmm. which has the 13 old Jesuit books on it, anti-Jesuit books, which totals about 4,000 pages. So in total, the e-book, the two CDs, total about 6,000 pages. Sheesh, oh my God, yeah, that's <laughs> that's really something, you know, and um, what I really love about your book, Vatican Assassins, is the way it's uh, it's it's laid out and and the way some of the you know key people are are presented. You have a photo and a small caption about the perch, and that's it's arranged very good and it's a perfect uh, you know re as a reference book. Uh, I mean, this has must have been a huge research project and a, and a long process to get this book together, Eric. I mean, what yes. what motivated you? I mean, to begin with, to to write this book. Well, when I was in the fourth grade, which was 19 what 64, 63. I was 10 years old. Um, I was uh, there in the fourth grade class, and my teacher came in, Miss Beals, who I loved very much. I thought she was wonderful, and she was crying her eyes out. And I wondered what it was that was making her cry, and she said, the president has been shot. And um, I, I, that was a very traumatic experience for me, and I thought, someday I will find his killer, because when I saw the picture of Lyndon Baines Johnson, that criminal, uh, there uh, being sworn in on Air Force One, um, I knew that he was guilty, that he had to have been involved. Just as a little boy, I sensed that. Mm. And so after the Kennedy assassination, that I, when I was about 17, 18, I came to know the Lord as my Savior. And I began to read the Bible, and uh, then I began to be aware of the murder of Abraham Lincoln, where the Jesuits uh, killed Abraham Lincoln, and uh, that was covered up, and that's in a book called The Suppressed History About the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln, written by Burke McCarty in 1924, a very fearless woman. She had been a Roman Catholic and was saved, mm -hmm. and uh, she told the truth about that. She took her seven years to put the book together, and I had a history professor when I was in college who had a copy of that original book he used to keep in a safe. Hmm. And then uh, the third issue was, when I was off to Bible college between uh, 1979 and 81, 
or 77 to 79, I was at Baptist Bible College in Clarkson, Pennsylvania, and this issue of which Bible kept coming up, and of course I was reading the King James Bible, and I figured that the other versions were just maybe modern translations of the same underlying Greek text, mm-hmm. NIV, NASB, and others, until I realized or found out that the underlying Greek text for all of these new Bibles, every one of them, are pro Westcott and Hort, or the Nessel text, uh, which involved the Jesuit. Mm-hmm. And uh, so what we have is a underlying Greek text for all these New English Bibles that are founded on Jerome's Latin Vulgate, because mm-hmm. this Greek text follows Jerome's Latin Vulgate. And if you read of the uh, translators in England when they had the revision committee for some 10 years, between 1870 and 1880, they had snuck in a secret Greek text that there was no... No one knew where the origin was uh, was from, and this hmm. Scrivener writes about this in some of his work because he was at every meeting. Mm-hmm. So I came to three th- things that really traumatized me: the assassination of Kennedy, the assassination of Lincoln, and the attempted overthrow of the English Bible produced out of the Protestant Reformation. And so this caused me to begin my study on the Jesuit order and their doctrines and their deeds of blood for the last 500 years or so. Mm, very interesting, and, and maybe if, if there's time later, of course, I would love to talk about JFK and the, the assassination. But but again, let's b- go back, as it were, and um, you know, basically talk about the Jesuits. I, I guess we could assume uh, that we're talking to someone that don't know anything about the Jesuits. I mean, who who are they? Uh, what who who was behind their creation? And uh, you know, I mean, how, how long have they been around, basically? Uh, to begin with, the world had been in the Dark Ages for a thousand years. You figure from, let's say, 606 with Gregory the Great, if you want to commence the Dark Ages there, I would commence it even before that. I'd start it with Constantine when he created the Roman Catholic institution in 312. Mm-hmm. But we'll say 606 with, when the temporal, when the spiritual power of the Pope begins out of the, as the Bishop of Rome. So from 606 to approximately... Uh, the beginning of the Reformation when Martin Luther nailed his 95 Thesis on All Saints Church in Wittenberg on on October 31st, 1517, um, that ultimately began the Protestant Reformation. And so the Bible then was beginning to be put into the vernacular, into the native tongues of the people. You know, Luther put the Bible in the German language for the German people while he was Uh, at Wartburg for 10 months. Mm -hmm. And so as the Bible began to be put into the hands of the common man, whole nations began to realize that they did not need the priests to be right with God. They did not need the Pope to be right with God. Therefore, all the commercial activity of the Vatican was nothing but a grand theft, according to the Bible, because the Bible teaches in uh, 1 Timothy 2.5, there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And so therefore, if the Lord Jesus Christ of the Scriptures is the mediator, we don't need a priest, we don't need a pope, we don't need any kind of religious institution to get us to God. Mm. All we need is the person of the Son of God, as revealed in the Scriptures. So when the whole peoples began to realize this, they said, why, We're not, we don't need the papacy, and so not only breaking the spiritual power of Rome, which was absolutely imperative, through belief of the scriptures, they then were able to break the temporal power of the Pope. And this is so important because in the Dark Ages, the Pope ruled the kings. Mm -hmm. The kings ruled the people. If the people revolted against the Pope, the Pope would use the king and his armies to suppress the people. If the king revolted against the Pope, the Pope would use the peoples to overthrow and assassinate the king. But when the peoples and some kings realized they didn't need the papacy anymore, they broke the Pope's temporal power, and one of these nations was Sweden. Mm. (laughs) And as they broke the Pope's temporal power, the Pope no longer collected Peter's pence, that tax, no longer uh, controlled the king, and the king now could be able to govern for the benefit of his own people. Mm. So he's not going to tax them to death, he's not going to to do things that will destroy a nation, he will do things to build his nation because he is of his own people and wants to do the best for his people in the light of God's Word. So this is what happened. We had the Protestant Reformation started by Luther. Well, the devil's counterpart was Ignatius Loyola and his starting of the Jesuit order in 1534, Mm -hmm. uh, formally uh, in 
enfranchised by the Pope Paul III in 1540. And so with the creation of the Jesuit order, it had two primarily functions, according to Reverend James A. Wiley, who was probably the greatest English historian on the Reformation. He said in his book, in his second volume of Book 15, that the Jesuits were created, number one, to take Jerusalem away from the Muslims. Mm -hmm. Number one. Number two, that the Jesuits were to destroy the Protestant Reformation. And number three, uh, cause all the nations that had broken away from the Pope's temporal power to be restored to servitude under the Pope, uh, they being then under his temporal power once again. Hmm. So they had really a threefold purpose, to take the, the Jerusalem from the Muslims, to destroy the Reformation, and to, res to restore all nations under the temporal power of the Pope, who ultimately would be ruling the world from Jerusalem. This was the purpose of the Jesuit order. Hmm. And I have quoted in my book their secret bloody Jesuit oath. I have a copy of the secret instructions <laughs> on the old book CD so that you, you can read them all and see what their real purpose is. This uh, this oath that that you mentioned. Do you know if this is something that still is used today? Absolutely, hmm. it's used by all the Jesuits of the Fourth Vow. The Jesuits of the Fourth Vow um, either are created Jesuits of the Fourth Vow, directed by the Black Pope, or the Jesuit Superior General Peter Hans Kolbenbach, for specific purposes, or according to M.F. Um, Cusack, who was a nun the nun of Kenmare in a convent in England, she wrote the book, The Black Pope, which I also have mm -hmm. on my old book CD. And she says to be a Jesuit of the professor of the fourth vow, you need to be 31 years in the order. Hmm. Well, there are many Jesuits who have not been that long in the order that are professed of the fourth vow. Alberto Rivera was one of them. But uh, to be professed of the fourth vow, you take this, what's called the Jesuit bloody oath, and I have it from no less than six sources over a span of a hundred years, uh, cited in my book. Hmm. So it is true, and it shows how they have set out to create war against all the Protestant nations, all the Lutheran peoples of Sweden and Germany and Norway, etc., and to bring them back. And that they will pretend to be Protestants, they will pretend to be Lutherans, just to bring them back, quote, to Holy Mother Church. Hmm. I mean, the this thing with the secret um, you know alliances or oaths or whatever you want to call it to me it it sounds very much like a like a secret society in a way uh, oh, do you of think course. do you think it would be fair to call it the jesuits a secret society absolutely it is a secret society especially at the top uh, of course they take the all the jesuits take ultimately the first three vows they professed of the first second and third vow the Jesuits, uh, they're educated for, with 15 years of education after college. Uh, they are taught in every subject imaginable, and anything they're not, they're not completely aware of, they have professors at their beck and call whereby they can be completely informed as to the uh, intricacies of any topic. Mm -hmm. So the Jesuits are the, the brains of the papacy. No one is superior to them. And the Jesuit order is completely outside the control or command of the Pope or his hierarchy. No Jesuit is under orders from the Pope or the hierarchy. They're completely outside of it, just as Himmler's SS was completely out of the command structure of the Nazi Party. Hmm. So it's identical. Of course, Himmler's SS was patterned after the Jesuit order, and we can read that in Heinz Hone's work, The Order of the Death's Head, that is a classic on the SS, and it was first printed in 1966. Hmm. Fascinating. And, and I mean, if if we were to talk about the uh, what, what you refer to as the, as the Black Pope, uh, I guess today it still is it's uh, Peter Hans Kolbenbach, I guess. 